It's very good to see so many of you here. I nearly didn't make it myself when I got to Bath Spa Station this morning. There was a nice sign up in the station saying, owing to a rock fall on the line after the storm, there are no trains running between Bath and London. Um, so we waited and we waited, but fortunately they clear cleared the rocks, and here I am, and I'm going to tell you, not inappropriately, about how maths can save your life. How maths can save your life. So <clears throat> this lecture is inspired in no small part by my sister. And my sister, who's the brainy one of the family we reckon, is a consultant. Um, she's a consultant anaesthetist and she's part of the surgical team at um, <clears throat> Hereford Hospital, having studied medicine at King's College London. And she operates as well, as part of her team, they operate on people and save lives through doing operations. So my sister says, I save lives, what do you do Chris, you just do sums? And I say, well hopefully my sums save some lives as well, and so that's why I'm giving this lecture. Um, so if you are a patient and something is wrong with you, and uh, you might have a, a very severe headache, and they might suspect it's uh, due to a tumour, um, in the past, my sister would have been very busy, they would have operated on you, um, partly just to find out what was going on wrong inside you. And obviously that's, by its very nature, a dangerous process. If you're cutting the body, then it, um, it's tr as a trauma on the body, there's the risk of infection. And all of that has changed completely in the last 30 years or so due to the invention of scanning devices, medical scanning devices. So um, this has transformed modern medicine and has led to millions of lives being saved by the fact that you can now see what's going on without cutting you open. And there are a number of different ways of doing this, all of which I'm going to describe in this lecture. There's ultrasound, which uh, often is used if uh, you have a pregnant woman and you want to see um, how the, the um, baby is developing. Uh, there's MRI, which uses um, very large magnetic fields to do the imaging. And there are CAT scans, what stands for computerized axial tomography, uh, which use x-rays. So there's a CAT scan of the body, there's the kidneys, there's the backbone. So these are using what appear to be very different techniques, sound waves, magnetism, and x-rays are very different bits of physics. However, all of these techniques are based upon mathematics. And what I'm going to do is to show you in this lecture some of the maths that's used to make them work. And I chose to do this subject this year, this year being 2017, because as well as, Avatar, as um, being the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Passchendaele and of the Russian Revolution and the American entry into the war and other minor things, this is the 100th anniversary of the first mathematical paper on medical imaging. So we can say that medical imaging is 100 years old this year. I haven't seen it celebrated as much as it should be, so here I am to celebrate it and this is a major, major anniversary, I would argue. So, let's talk about um, math saving your life, and I want to put this lecture into the context of the general way that maths is used to save lives um, through solving what are called inverse problems. Now, in mathematics, we often think of math, people say to me, maths is a very uncreative subject, they say. I say, why? They say, one plus one equals two. How uncreative can that be? Well, 
<clears throat> despite the fact that it's actually a very creative statement, um, maths, the sort of maths that's used in medical imaging isn't like that. It's much more along the lines of, here is the answer, what's the question? I'll give you an example. Here is a, a pen top, right? Um, if I throw that, as it moves through the air and obeys Newton's laws of motion, that's mathematically a little bit like 1 plus 1 equals 2. It's a process you can work it out. I will throw it, okay? There it goes. It's landed on, on the carpet. It doesn't really matter where it's landed. Now, I want you to imagine that you've just come into this room and you look at the carpet and you see the pen top. You've now got to work out what happened. Why did that pen top land there and when was it thrown? And that's an inverse problem. And that's much, much harder and that is the sort of problem that we have to solve when we do medical imaging. Inverse problems are the problems associated with working out what happens when you see, when you've measured it. You've measured something, what has caused that? So one of the obvious users of inverse problems are forensic scientists. So a forensic scientist um, is employed by the police in order to find out what caused the crime that they are investigating. And I'd like to say that although forensic scientists are portrayed on the TV as wearing sunglasses and looking very cool, they all have to learn maths at Forensic Science College. So here's the scenario. The forensic scientist has found a bullet at a crime scene. What's the former problem? Well, the former problem is the process of if I take a gun and I fire it, where does it go? And that's an easy problem to solve. You can solve that problem using the sort of mathematics you would typically learn, even at A-level at school, possibly at undergraduate. That's called a forward problem. You have all the information. You see where it's going. An inverse problem is the much harder one. The forensic scientist has walked into the room. They find the bullet in the wall. And just from the evidence of where the bullet is, the amount of damage in the wall, the angle of the bullet, how far it's gone in, they have to work out where it was fired from, what sort of gun fired it, and was it fired by a right-handed right Russian with a one eye or something like that. Okay, the sort of stuff that Poirot does. So this is the sort of thing we do, and um, inverse problems are extremely important in forensic science, and they lie at the heart of all of medical imaging, and some other tech things I'll tell you about later on, about saving lives. Um, but just to show you some of the problems that can be solved with them, um, we've already seen that they can be um, related to medical imaging, that they are related to forensic science. Um, if you are searching for oil, you need to find out where the oil is. You need to solve one of these problems, so prospecting for oil. We can also use them to save the whales, and we can use them to cure cancer. So I'm a mathematician. What do I do with my life? I save the whales and I cure cancer. That's not so bad, is it? Um, however, problems of the nature I described are very hard to solve. There's my pen top somewhere on the carpet still. We still don't know when it was thrown there. It's extremely hard to work that out. So inverse problems are very hard to solve. When I um, first learned about them, my professor at the time explained to me that solving an inverse problem was like being in this room and next door you have a pianist wearing a coat, wearing boxing gloves, playing the piano through several feet of wall. By the way, you're wearing earmuffs yourself and you have to try and work out what the individual notes are. It's really, really hard. So they can have what we say non-unique solutions. I could have thrown that pen top uh, earlier on today, I could have thrown it when I threw it, or I could have thrown it just now. It's virtually impossible to tell just from the evidence, and that's something which is really hard. And in medicine, that's terribly important because the, you could reconstruct an entirely false image which is still consistent with the data. Some inverse problems have no solutions at all. The data that you gather may have errors in it, which means that you can't solve the problem. Um, you may not have enough data. And there's always a problem, what we call noise. 
which is randomness imposed on measurements, which makes them very hard to work out what the true ones are. But this is what we have to do, and that's the process I'm going to tell you a little bit about today, mostly in the context of medical imaging. And I spend a lot of my life working on these sort of things. Many other people do as well. Um, but the riches of doing this are very great because you literally can cure cancer, save the whales, find the oil, cure all known diseases, and maybe do a bit of forensic science as well. So it's a very, very uh, important area of mathematics, and that's why I want to tell you about it today. So let's go back in uh, uh, a few uh, years and see where inverse problems came from, particularly in the context of medical imaging. Um, and arguably, uh, the first of these problems uh, came from the work of Röntgen. Here he is, uh, the German mathematician, uh, scientist, um, uh, just over 100 years ago in 1895. And basically, Röntgen was studying very high voltage electrical discharges um, from um, tubes, uh, evacuated tubes, where you put a high voltage across. And he made the serendipitous discovery that if you put a very high voltage across a tube, then um, some salts, which he had in the laboratory for an entirely different purpose, started to glow. Um, and he, this is, a lot of science is like this. A lot of it is it's serendipity. You find things out by accident. This is very hard to tell the government when you're applying for money, but uh, it's the way it's often done. Um, and Rungton realized that something must be causing the salts to glow, and he did a series of experiments, and he realized that it was a, a, some sort of ray that was coming from the tube that he was putting the voltage across, um, but the ray, he couldn't see it, it wasn't light, so he didn't know what to call it, so he called it an X-ray. Um, and it was realized shortly afterwards that an X-ray was exactly the same as light in that it obeyed the same equations of light. These are the equations that Maxwell had worked out, but it had much higher energy and it had a much, much higher frequency and a much shorter wavelength. The fact it had high energy was very important because it meant that unlike light, X-rays would go through um, tissue like the skin, but would be obstructed by uh, bigger uh, amounts of stuff like bone. Um, and Röntgen discovered this, um, and he also discovered that it would fog a, photo, a, 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 photo, a photographic plate. Um, and this here is the very first X-ray ever taken, and it was of his wife's hand. So this is his wife's hand. Um, there's her wedding ring. And you can see very clearly the bones of the hands. And I think this is part of the patent application that he made. Um, and here is the actual process. Uh, there's the, the X-ray camera. There he's putting his hand and, uh, on the plate, and an X-ray is being taken. So this is historically incredibly important photograph. It's the, the very first X-ray of his wife's hand. Um, so that was in 1895. Not long after, we got the uh, First World War, and um, X-rays were realised. It was realised that X-rays could be very helpful in seeing what injuries <coughs> had been caused to the soldiers. The great advantage, of course, in X-ray was that you could see whether a bone was broken without having to cut the um, hand open or the leg open or whatever. Um, and here's a very, very famous person, that's Marie Curie herself, um, who during the war uh, drove an ambulance um, equipped with X-ray technology. Um, and now X-rays are used everywhere. So here is um, one of the projects that I'm involved with at Bath, is uh, helping doctors do diagnoses of uh, patients with hip fractures. Um, as quickly as possible, because hip fracture is a very, very serious problem. You have to diagnose very fast. Um, and here is um, an X-ray of a hip, and you can see very clearly that this patient here has an artificial hip joint uh, attached to them and various other pins as well. So that's the sort of image, and that's an X-ray image, and that's the technology 
up till about 1970. And what an X-ray basically is, is a glorified shadow. It's a shadow of the bones that are, are cast. Um, and there are various problems with the use of X-rays in this uh, context. Firstly, they were pretty well useless for finding uh, anything other than bones. It's gone straight through all the soft tissue, so you can't see the intestines, you can't see any of the organs or anything like that. And the second problem was that it was essentially just a shadow of one orientation of the body. Um, so you couldn't tell from that whether the bone was circular, whether it was square, whether it was triangular, or what shape it was at all. So there was very limited information. Now, with mathematics, we can do far, far better. But still, using, um, essentially, X-ray technology. So this is a modern CAT scanner. CAT stands for Computerized Axial Tomography. Um, tomography is a, a combination of two words, tomos and graphos, which means slice, basically. It's, it's an image of a slice through the body. And this patient is about to have their head put inside a scanner. I'll show you what's inside the scanner in a minute. Um, and using that, we can take an image. This is the image on the front page of the talk. There's clearly their brain uh, with the brain stem there. Um, this is an image uh, from the top. Um, from a, a point of view of a diagnosis, this is a very important image because you can see here that there is a tumour. And that tumour can be located using this technology uh, in a way that would not have been possible um, before 1970. And um, in this case, the doctors would be able to operate and remove the tumour, um, and hopefully the patient would then recover. So what does a CAT scanner do? Well, what a CAT scanner does is instead of taking one X-ray, it takes lots of X-rays, and then it uses maths to assemble the pictures that it takes into a kind of a much bigger picture, which allows you to work out what's going on actually inside the body itself. So um, I'm going to do um, an illustration of some of the maths behind it. Um, some of the maths I'm going to talk about will be a bit scary. I'll warn you in advance. Uh, but the next bit of maths is adding up. So we should be able to do that. Um, so we're going to look at this problem here. Um, we have some malt bottles. So every, every morning uh, I... Well, I don't anymore, because I've moved. But where I used to live, I used to get my milk delivered to me. Um, and the milk would come in containers, like uh, uh, trays like this, with bottles. And sometimes you'd get a, a bottle full of milk. And sometimes you'd get a bottle full of juice. And sometimes they'd just be an empty bottle. Um, I'm not sure why, but sometimes they gave me empty bottles. Um, OK, it was Bristol. Um, so. Um, my question, being a mathematician, would be, let's suppose um, I couldn't sort of see the bottles, but I, I wanted to know what was what. One way you might think it would be possible to work out what bottles I had would be to shine a light through the tray. And then I can look at the light, and I would be able to maybe see what was happening because the light gets absorbed by the bottles in different ways. So a milk bottle absorbs a lot of light, a juice bottle absor absorbs um, less light, um, and uh, a, a milk bottle with no milk, an empty milk bottle, absorbs no light at all. So this is kind of an experiment I could do with light in my eyes. So let's continue with that. Here it might be my um, uh, a tray, which could contain either a milk bottle in, a tr in one of those squares or a juice bottle in one of those squares, or an empty bottle in one of those squares. And I know from extensive <coughs> calculations that if I have a milk bottle, it will absorb three units of light. If I have a juice bottle, it absorbs two units of light, and an empty milk bottle absorbs one unit of light. Okay? So if I shine a light through 
here, through this line here, and there were three milk bottles, then that would absorb three units of light for the first, three units of light for the second, three units of light for the third, in other words, nine units of light. If there was three empty milk bottles, it would absorb three units of light. And the tomography problem goes like this. Um, I shine the light this way, that way, that way, and then that way, that way, and that way, and you measure how much light has been absorbed. And if I measure it that way, I find there are five units of light absorbed. That way, there are six units of light absorbed, and that way are four units. This way, there are six units. That way, there are three units. That way, there are six units. And the question is, where are the bottles? How could you place milk bottles so that the amount of light would be consistent with this? Okay. So that is a problem in tomography. That's the problem you have to solve to make medical imaging work. So I'll give you a clue. We've got three in this direction, and that means I have one empty milk bottle there, one empty milk bottle there, and one empty milk bottle there, but the rest you have to work out yourself. Okay. Now I could set this as a puzzle. I could set it as a puzzle in the Times or the Today programme or whatever, but I'm not going to strain your brains too much. I'll show you the answer. Okay. So um, we've got one, one, one. There's the answer. But hang on. We knew there was one, 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 but actually, both of those work. Let's check. That's got to add up to five. Three, one, one does add up to five, but so does two, one, two. Uh, two, one, three has got to add up to six, so does two, one, three, but two, one, one and one, one, two also add up to four. So we have two answers. Now, people tell me maths is a very uncreative subject because one plus one only has one answer and that's two. And here we have, in this problem, two answers to the same problem, which can be quite concerning, but it's the world that we live in. As I said, when I threw that pen on the, ta on the carpet, there are many possible answers to the question, when did I throw it? And in the context of this milk bottle problem, there are two possible answers. From a medical point of view, this could be quite dangerous because that could be correspond to one diagnosis and that to another one, and the poor doctor can't tell one from the other. So we have to help them, and the mathematician will say, well, actually, this is a problem where you need a bit more information, and the information I'm going to give you is I'll shine the light through this diagonal and that diagonal, and if I shine it through this diagonal, then I have six uh, units absorbed, and this one is three. In that case, that solution works fine, but that wouldn't work. So we can reject that, and we know that's the correct one, and that's where my bottles are. Milk, two empties, juice, empty milk, two empties, and a juice. And there we are. That is our first tomography problem. And that's what we have to solve when you do medical imaging. And I hope you get some idea now why mathematics might be useful. So let's get back to medicine. Oh, now before we go to medicine, just to say, I advertise this as a problem that we could have in the Guardian or the Times or stuff. And this has been latched onto, and there are at least two problems out there which appear in newspapers, both of which have the same sort of idea of trying to reconstruct something from information. Uh, on the left, we have killer Sudoku. And what you do in killer Sudoku is, in this box, you have to put two numbers which add up to four. There are two numbers which add up to seven. There are three which add up to uh, 18, I think. There are three which add up to 24. And that is essentially the same problem, but dressed up. Um, and Gridler, which is one of my favorite games, where um, you have to, um, you're given information how many black uh, uh, squares there are, how many uh, uh, black squares there are this way, and you have to put that information together to give a picture. And I strongly recommend having a go at Gridlers. They're very, very addictive and great fun to do. Now let's get back to some medicine. So um, this is what happens 
in a, a typical scanning device. If I was Marie Curie and I was in my x-ray van and a soldier presents themselves, this is what Marie Curie would do. She would switch on her x-ray source. The x-ray source would send out x-rays in these different directions like this. Um, and if I put a, an object um, in the way of the x-rays, uh, like a bone or something, um, then you have a detector over here, which could be your photographic plate or some other way of detecting the strength of the x-rays. Um, and then if an x-ray doesn't go through the bone, it doesn't get absorbed, so it's quite strong. That's here. But if it goes through the bone, particularly if it goes to the middle, it gets strongly observed, absorbed. And if we measure the intensity of the x-ray along the distance of the plate, then we get this big shadow like this. Um, and that's typically what you'd see. So that's one measurement, um, which allows you to work out the thickness of the bone, that distance there, but and maybe the, the, um, uh, the width of the bone as well, um, but doesn't tell you anything more. Um, but what happens in a CAT scanner is you don't just take one um, uh, a position for the source, you take several, so there's one up there, one there, and you measure the x-rays from many different angles, and in fact you rotate the source around, um, that's why they have these sort of circular holes that you put your head into, and you hear um, a noise as the whole thing moves around, and that's how the x-rays are um, moved around the head and detected all the way around. So that's how um, the x-ray kind of um, system works. Um, so um, I'm now going to give you a warning, uh, I, a warning I, I have to give to my students. I'm required to give this nowadays. There will be maths in the next slide. Okay. Um, just in case they get a bit shocked. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at a single x-ray here, which is going through my object, and I want to see how that is absorbed. So I do want to warn you, there will be some maths in the next slide, so, but just bear with me. If, if you don't like the maths, uh, just um, try to get a feel for the physics. Um, so here we go. Here's an x-ray that goes through um, part of the body. And an x-ray has an intensity. At the start, it's very high energy. It comes out of the source with lots of energy. And as it goes through the body, it gets absorbed, it loses its energy and, until it gets to the end where it's much lower energy. If it passes through um, a bit of the body which has a density, so bone has high density, flesh has um, low density, um, and I'll call that density U, um, and the width of the body is delta S, this is the amount it's gone through, then it loses a bit of intensity. And the amount it loses we'll call delta I. So that's the intensity the x-ray loses as it goes through the flesh, and that's its density. And um, people understand that the, the amount that you lose is equal to the density of the material times the intensity times the width of the um, body it passes through. So that's the amount of intensity that's lost just in that little bit of flesh there. Um, if you then add this up over all of them, you go through this mathematical process which is called integration, and um, we find that the intensity at the finish, that's the one that you measure, is the intensity at the start times the um, exponential function e raised to the power minus r, where r is this thing here. Um, now, let me unpack that in a way which might be more useful. Um, if I know this and I know this, then I can work out this. And this tells me the average density of the human body in the direction of that single x-ray. So, and what we do in this process here is we work out the average density of the body in every single different direction, or to put it more prosaically, we look at the strength of the x-ray shadow 
for different directions as you go around the body. And that's what's going on in these devices when they do the imaging. So we know this thing here. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about more about the geometry and then we'll um, do another bit of somewhat scary maths. Um, so the geometry is that you have the source here of the x-rays, there's the detector, there's my x-ray going through. Um, well imagine that the, the middle of the body is at the position zero and the angle of the x-ray is the angle theta and the distance of the x-ray from the closest point to the centre we'll call rho um, and there's my density there and what the x-ray device can do is it can measure the attenuation of the x-ray for all these different angles and distances to give this famous number r which is the average density of the body in the direction of the x-ray. So that, that's what's going on in these devices. We'll work out in a minute why it's called R. Okay, it has the name R for a very special reason. So that's what's going on. That is the kind of engineering aspect of a, a, an X-ray device. What it does is it finds the average density of the body in many, many different directions. And what the maths has to do is turn that measurement into a picture. Turn that measurement into a picture. Right. The next two slides again are going to be quite scary and then we won't do much more maths for a while. Which may be a relief, it certainly is to me. Okay, so, um, along uh, an x-ray at distance rho from the centre and angle theta, a typical point xy is given by this formula, which means that my thing that I measure is this integral here as a function of rho and of theta. And this I can measure for lots and lots of angles and lots and lots of distances. And this thing has a name. It is called the Radon Transform. The Radon Transform, and it takes U, which is the body and its density, and all the bits of the body that we want to discover, and it turns it into something else. And what it turns it into is called a sinogram. A sinogram. Okay. So, that's the scary maths. Let's draw some pictures now. Um, imagine, imagine that you had a square bone. Fortunately, we don't, but it's useful to imagine one. Here is an object, which is a square bone. And these black lines are very highly absorbing, and the white bits don't absorb at all. If I shine an X-ray straight through here, then it gets slightly absorbed by these two, but not much absorbed, really. But if I shine it exactly along that line, or exactly along that line, or that line, or that line, it gets very strongly absorbed. And this is the sinogram corresponding to this, this function R. And this sinogram has four spots and a bit some grey stuff. Those four spots correspond exactly to the four lines of the square and the four angles corresponding to those lines. So that's the sinogram for a square. Here is a head. Well, it's an artificial head. Uh, it's used as a test sort of uh, image for many uh, testing many, many um, uh, techniques out on. And this is the sinogram that you get from it. Now, when I told you about the milk bottle problem, I said that that was a problem that we could possibly put in a newspaper as something to solve. Here is the same problem. These are the um, amounts absorbed for all the different angles and all the different distances. And your job as a medical imaging expert is to try to take this and turn it back into the picture. Okay, so that's the problem. And it's not very easy, but fortunately, due to the work of an Austrian genius, uh, it was solved. And it was solved a hundred years ago. And this is the anniversary that I want to celebrate. 
Um, and here's my genius. There he is. I'm a great fan of this guy. This is a guy called Johann Radon, who 100 years ago wrote a paper which is the whole basis of medical imaging. That's when it all started in 1917. He was working in the war. Um, he was looking at shadows. I think he was doing it just out of interest. There wasn't any reason for it. Um, and he realised that if you could do all these measurements, then there was a process by which you could turn these measurements back into a picture. And that's his mathematical formula that he wrote down in his paper. Yes. OK. We call this thing the Radon Transformer R in honour of this very, very great man here. And that man who, through that paper 100 years ago, has saved many lives. I really like this guy. Um, if you go into any decent school and meet one of the older math teachers, he's likely to look like him. <laughs> OK. It's absolutely as you should look. Glasses, bald head, moustache, the lot. OK. It looks quite like my old grandfather as well, so I'm, I'm a, bit, a bit of a fan of this guy. OK. And, and here is this formula here. OK. So a little bit of history again. So 1917 was when Radon came up with his paper. Um, and it, people knew about the paper. They knew about this, this idea. But of course, 1917, there wasn't anything like the technology to either take the x-rays and measure them or to implement this formula to build, um, uh, to get the images sorted out. And we had to wait till about the, the 1970s when uh, two people, Hounsfield and Cormac, who ri quite rightly got the Nobel Prize, um, worked with the company EMI, also known for being the record company which um, um, produced the Beatles, and partly on the profits that they made from the Beatles, invested it into, into this technology. Um, created a thing called the EMI scanner. The EMI scanner. So that's based on the profits of the Beatles. I'm sure they would have been very pleased. Um, and that, this technique here implements this idea that I've told you about um, and took Radon's formula. Um, since then, mathematicians have worked very hard. There's a guy called Cax Marx who came up with a much better formula than Radon in the sense that it was quicker and easier to use. And that was what was actually implemented in the EMI scanner. Um, nowadays, we have other methods, this thing called the CG method, which is um, something I work with a lot um, and teach my students, uh, which is better still. Um, and this technology is used in all these scanning devices. So this was a massive breakthrough. And it was a breakthrough that was made in the 1970s based on the work of this fantastic man in 1917. You'll notice that it took um, 50 years for the mathematical idea to actually end up as a bit of technology. Again, this is an important thing to know. Math sometimes takes time. Something I tell, again, the government when trying to get money out of them, not always successfully. OK, so there, there's... Oh, by the way, he didn't win a Nobel Prize, but these guys did. Mathematicians don't win Nobel Prizes. It's not fair. OK. So that's the EMI scanner. And that's the kind of um, father of all modern medical imaging technology. Um, and that's the result. There we go. Um, the sort of thing you could do, um, you could put someone's head inside one of these things and you get an image of the brain. You can see the great mass, gray matter, the spinal cord, everything. And, and this was an enormous diagnostic breakthrough. You, nowadays, you can do much more. Um, these are two of my colleagues at Bath. This is Mark Greco and Catherine Mitchell. Um, and they turned their brain to solving another one of the big problems of the 20th century, 21st century. Again, very much associated with saving lives, uh, which is what's happening to the bees. So the bee population is declining. Um, and this is of great concern to farmers because bees pollinate crops. Um, and we want to monitor the bees to see what they're doing and how they respond to climatic changes or changes in habitat or in the environment. Um, and one of the problems with doing this is that if you have a beehive, 
and you open up the beehive, it obviously disturbs the bees, and so they don't react um, in a kind of normal way. <coughs> and so one way to overcome this is to take this same technology that works so well in the medical context and to apply it to a beehive. Um, so what, what Mark um, did, Mark being the bee man, as it were, was to take his hives and we put uh, scanning devices around them um, and uh, the, that scan through the beehive in just the way that you scan through the head. Um, with two important caveats, uh, one that you had to use very low doses because the bees can great, get greatly affected by radiation and secondly, um, unlike human beings, bees tend to buzz around uh, rather inconveniently when you're trying to image them, so you had to do things very, very quickly. Um, and that required more mathematics, which is where Catherine came in, um, and myself to a certain extent. Um, and here is the, the sort of result, which we're rather pleased with, um, just to give you some idea. Um, this is a beehive. These red dots here are actual bees, uh, some of which are in flight. Um, the yellow bit here is honey, and this is uh, the brood, this is the bee larvae growing. Um, and all that was achieved with the same sort of technology um, without harming any bees in the process. And so we're now able to monitor bees and see how they're reacting to their environment. So that's basically a short description of cat technology. Um, and it has many advantages. One is, it's relatively cheap. And uh, there's a, a new a development called um, impedance tomography, which again I'm working on a lot, which is extremely cheap. You could take it in a suitcase, you could wrap it around a patient um, in the field and do a tomographic image of them, which is really useful. Um, and it's reliable. The technology's been around for a while. We understand it. Uh, we're not that likely to make mistakes in finding the wrong answer. However, it's also a bad cat. Um, it has two dis big disadvantages. One, that the images, whilst they look wonderful at the time, in fact, um, we can do much, much better now with the resolution. And secondly, and much, much more importantly, um, x-rays are actually quite dangerous. So you really don't want to expose people to them any more than you have to, and you especially don't want to expose their heads to them any more than you want to. So this lack of resolution and the fact that x-ray is dangerous um, spurred on the development of a new type of technology uh, which was originally called NMR or nuclear magnetic resonance um, and is now called magnetic resonance imaging um, developed in part by a guy called Raymond Damadio. It's very likely that some of you may have been um, MRI scanned if you were in the hospital. I won't ask for a show of hands, it's embarrassing but if you have scanned, consider yourself fortunate. Um, so here is an MRI scanner. Um, this is where the patient's going to lie, and this thing here is a very, 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 very strong magnet. Okay. Um, I work with these things, and what you have to do when you go into the door is take everything out of your pockets which could conceivably be attracted to the magnet and that certainly includes your credit cards which may not be attracted to the magnet but will certainly get wiped in the process. Okay, so you don't want to do that. Um, so you take everything out. Um, the place where I work with MRI, which is called the Sick Kids Hospital, um, has on display an example of a, um, uh, a, 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 an electrical meter measuring meter which someone had accidentally left in the room and had pinged across the room at high speed when the magnet was turned on and had um, made a, a nasty dent um, in the wall of the building. So you don't put anything magnetic. So, so here's a very strong magnetic field and there's where the patient goes in, into there. Um, and this is what happens when you're inside. Uh, there is the patient. Uh, you're surrounded by the magnet um, and um, you have... Uh, various coils around which are going to do various things. I'll talk about those in a second um, um, when you're inside this, this thing. Now these things are kind of quite awkward. They're kind of like going into a, a tunnel and they make an incredible noise. 
an incredible noise and are quite frightening. Um, so my son, some many years ago, uh, had an accident on his bike and broke his knee. And took, they took him to the hospital and confronted him with one of these. And he was very frightened by it. So what we did was we got his teddy bear. And the teddy bear went through the process and was scanned and came out unscathed. And my son felt that that was okay. If the teddy can take it, so could he. So in he went and was scanned through the device. So that's what goes on. And, and here's the basic physics. Um, what's going on in, in an MRI scanner. Um, so you, you, you go inside and you apply a very strong magnetic field to Tesla. So um, the Tesla, which is the unit of magnetic strength, um, is, is works that um, one or two is actually a very strong field indeed. Um, this is applied to your body, and I'm assured by the doctors that this is entirely safe. I'm sure they're right. Um, the, the magnetic field causes the protons, the hydrogen um, protons, you've got a lot of hydrogen in your body because you've got water, to spin, and some spin in one direction, and the, some spin in the other direction. And most of the directions cancel out, but a few don't. Um, then they apply a very large magnetic uh, radio frequency pulse, um, and the protons, which are spinning kind of out of synchronization with their other fellows, um, realign, and as they realign, they gave, give off uh, radio waves. Um, you can then detect these radio waves as they come out by the coils in the device, and using a bit of mathematics called the fast Fourier transform, um, you can then reassemble that into a picture, and that's how an MRI picture is constructed. And, and because MRI works by essentially looking at radiation coming from inside the body outwards, instead of radiation going through the body, which is what x-rays do, um, it actually is a much better problem to solve, and you get much better images as a result. They're better and they're safer. Um, and that's the sort of result that you can get. If, if we compare that with that you'll see how much better it is. That is an astonishing resolution. We're getting all the soft tissue, you uh, can see all the bits of the brain, very, very high detail here. Um, a really astonishing resolution that can be achieved with MRI scanning. Um, so it's a safer technology and it's, it's better resolution. Um, the main catch of this is it's much more expensive and these magnets are really I mean, you, you, a hospital would stretch to have more than one um, in it. I mean, they are very, very expensive bits of kit. Well, some of them might, but anyway, they're expensive. But fantastic technology. Um, it's so fantastic, you can literally see what people are thinking. Um, in what's called functional MRI, um, the, uh, the MRI is used to look at the blood flow in the brain, by particularly looking at the oxygen. And um, it's well known that when you're using your brain and thinking using a particular part of your brain, it requires more blood flow. Um, and so you can take pictures of the blood flow and therefore quite literally see what people are thinking. Um, so functional MRI can be used to look at the way people perceive things in different ways. So this is still um, technology which is developing, but very exciting technology um, uh, in terms of understanding brain processes. Okay, so that's MRI. Um, let's look at another technology, which is one many, many of you may have come across, which is ultrasound technology. Um, so CAT scans work with x-rays, not particularly nice because x-rays are rather powerful. MRI scans are great, but require huge magnets. Um, ultrasound is a technology which is safe because it just uses sound and doesn't require huge magnets, so it's a very straightforward technology um, for clinics to have. Um, and because ultrasound is safe, it's used widely for pregnant women, so there's a woman being scanned with an ultrasound, and there is an image of her child in her womb. Uh, I know... Uh, personally, when, when we had the first scan done when my wife was pregnant, 
uh, some years ago, um, 25 years ago to be precise, and seeing my daughter in the womb was an incredible moment for us. You know, that's when we really realised that our lives were going to be different from there on afterwards. Um, so this is ultrasound, and it's all based around a lovely, pe the lovely mathematical formula called the wave equation. Uh, this in, in this case, U is the intensity of the ultrasound, and C is the speed at which it's going through the body at a position X. Um, and the basic physics is low-intensity ultrasound is transmitted from a transducer. Um, they pass through the body on paths. The paths are given by the mathematics of the equation here, the wave equation. Um, these depend upon the speed. Um, the speed itself depends upon the density of the body. And what you do is you look at all the paths that the sound's taking, um, and from those you can calculate the speed uh, within the body. And that gives you the density, and that gives you the image. And that's how that image is constructed. Um, I'm sure you'll see that the resolution is, is poor compared with MRI. It's perfectly good enough to check that the, the child is basically healthy, um, but the resolution is, is too low to do much more in the way of diagnosis, um, but has the huge advantage of portability and safety. Um, the same technology, exactly, is used by oil companies. Um, so an oil company would have a ship with a, a, a much bigger transducer, which gives off more um, energy, but still sound energy. That passes through the sea, then through the rock, and then gets reflected off, off um, uh, layers of the rock or the oil and comes back. And you measure the um, sound as it comes back. Um, and from that, you can work out the speed. And from the speed, you can work out where the oil is. And so that technology, the same technology that's used in uh, uh, pregnant women, is used to prospect for oil. It's exactly the same. Um, Technology for detecting whales under the sea um, so that ships don't bang into them as you're moving them around or indeed get um, let you let off one of these to hurt the whales or just generally work out where the whales are also uses ultrasound. It's exactly the same technology and is out there saving the whales. So there we are. I've advertised that we can save the whales. What was the other thing we wanted to do? Oh yes, cure cancer. So we can cure cancer with ultrasound um, and medical imaging, well, to be precise, we can cure some sort of cancer sometimes. Um, and uh, a wonderful new technique has been developed recently called the um, MR high few technique, the magnetic resonance high intensity focused ultrasound technique. Um, and the idea behind this is that ultrasound is very safe technology, but if you turn up the intensity and focus it, then um, particularly if you focus the ultrasound on a tumour, you can actually use it to uh, literally burn the tumour out. Um, so this is a new technique. There's a transducer. There is um, the beam of ultrasound focused in on some sort of nasty in the body. Um, it's very like taking uh, rays in the sun and focusing them on a... Uh, spot to try to heat up the spot and the idea is that most of the time the uh, ultrasound is not focused enough to cause any damage but if you do your maths right you can focus it to burn out the tumour. Um, you can't just do the maths, you've got to monitor it as it goes because there's bits of the body you can't really um, prescribe in advance and so the magnetic resonance imaging is used to look at the temperature of the body which you can do and here's, and combined with the ultrasound, you measure the temperature, you can focus in. Um, and at this place I mentioned earlier, the Sick Kids Hospital, the, um, this technique is being used to destroy bone marrow cancer. Um, it's going through clinical trials at the moment, um, but I'm very, very hopeful that this could be a, a, a new way of destroying tumours in bodies and therefore hopefully doing something about cancer. Okay. So um, I now want to quickly talk about two other ways that maths can save your life using imaging uh, before we finish. So number one is space. Now my next lecture, which will be in a month's time on the 14th of November, will be about maths and space. 
maths and space. Um, but just as a little warm-up, um, we can use tomography on a very large scale to image the ionosphere. That's the uh, top bit of the atmosphere, where all the radio waves propagate around. And the way this is done is we take GPS satellites, which are orbiting around the atmosphere, and sending signals down, which you measure on your uh, mobile phones to see where you are. Um, and we take those signals, and we look at how strong they are when they arrive. So the signals are being absorbed by the atmosphere, identically to the way that X-rays are absorbed in the body. So if you take enough signals, and there's lots of GPS satellites around, and you measure in enough places, then by doing this, you can work out the behavior of the ionosphere. Again, this is work done by my colleague Catherine Mitchell in the Invert Center in Bath. Um, and what you can do with this is you can work out the state of the ionosphere. Um, and this is a map that Catherine produced showing an ionospheric storm uh, across um, the southern parts of the United States. Why is this important? because our entire communication systems rely on uh, uh, radio waves going through the ionosphere up to satellites and back down again. And if these storms are large, that's all disrupted, so it's going to affect our telecommunications and therefore lives. Um, very directly, it affects where, how we position our aeroplanes and whether they can stay in land or not safely. So this is very important work. Um, and my final example to save lives is the one of Finding landmines. These are nasty things. And landmines in certain parts of the world um, look like this. That's an anti-personnel landmine with a tripwire. Um, landmines are hidden in foliage with tripwires. Um, here's an example. There's some foliage. In that picture, there are three tripwires. Can you see them? Maybe not. Maybe they can. There's one, nice and brig. There's another one. That's part of a plant, that's part of a plant, that's part of a plant. But there's one across there, which is harder to see. And so the question is, can we find the tripwires? And the answer is, using all this technology I've introduced, yes, we can. Tripwires are just like uh, x-rays going through the body. If you can um, uh, uh, look for uh, um, x-rays, you can see what x-rays do, you can find tripwires. And so what you do is you take the picture that we've done, you take this famous radon transform, um, and as in our square, we had four spots. The spots here correspond to the tripwires. You isolate those, you transform back, and that's what you get, an image with the tripwires all colored in. And this technology that we developed is now being used by the Canadian Army to find and get rid of landmines um, in countries after wars as part of their peacekeeping activities. And it's the same technology that's used in medical scanners. So just to conclude, um, medical imaging now saves countless lives every day. It works because of a lot of mathematics. And the advances in the mathematics have driven the technology. So this 100-year-old this paper has now led to this entire medical imaging uh, technology that we rely on so much. And the same mathematics can save lives in many other ways. So if nothing else, this is a reason for saying hurrah for mathematics. Thank you very much.